Imagine if your next door neighbor was putting their child into a small room for five or six hours a day as a consequence for their behavior. And basically that's isolation. Now imagine the response of the neighbors around them or you, if that's what your neighbor was doing. I am sure you'd be calling the police, you'd be calling protective services because that's abuse. Now apply the same rule with the same response to institutions where that happens days, weeks, months at a time. How come we don't apply that same value to the kids in the juvenile hall? What's changed? They're still children. We're still isolating them. Those youth, they're still kids. No matter what they did, they are still kids. The thought of having so many young men, particularly on Rikers Island, in solitary confinement is extremely distressing to me. It is a remarkable fact that 27% of the adolescents on Rikers Island are in solitary confinement. You know, it is more than 10 times the normal utilization of, in solitary confinement uh, in, in the United States. And I don't know that those numbers are reasonable, uh, but it is, it is off the curve. You know, most of these people have not been convicted of anything or, or certainly sentenced. Um, the reason that most of them are in jail is because they can't afford bail. Some have said that this is not really segregation. It's not like the, the federal um, maximum security units, but I've been to supermax prisons and uh, I've been to Rikers Island and uh, it's, uh, it is quite similar. The American Academy of Adolescent and Child Psychiatry says you cannot put adolescents in solitary confinement. And there are prisons and jail systems throughout the world with, you know, with taking care of populations comparable to, to ours that don't use solitary confinement. But yet the first day as the board member, I met with the warden at the adolescent facility. I said, you know, so what are you doing? What's the, what's the, you know, how can this be improved? And they said, more solitary confinement. Prison itself isn't a suitable living situation, but solitary to box is just far more worse. I had a Brooklyn robbery case I called January 13, 2006. You 16? Oh, you're going to Rikers. Solitary confinement, the box, I heard, you know, people talking about coming out the box and them saying that they're happy to be in population. And I was, I, I could never understand that. I could never understand that. Like, you're still in jail. So how are you happy? I couldn't understand that until I went. <laughs> then I understood. Going in the box, they mind just can't take it. Simply just can't take it, you know. Some people do feel anxious. Some people just, you know, yo, I gotta get out of here. You know what I mean, all day I gotta get out of here. I gotta move around, you know. Some people just can't take just sitting in a small space all day, every day. That's a lot. That's a lot, and that's is that's brutal on a person's mind. Also, like that's that's. Brutal, brutal punishment. Like your eyes, you know, start to play tricks on you. You know, like you start seeing black dots, and you, and you like focus on them. That's kind of crazy. It looks crazy. You know, like if I was to sit here and like demonstrate it, like how it used to look, it looks crazy. It's like you see the black dots, and you just focusing on the black dots, and your eyes is just following them around in the cell, all over. 
you just looking and then, you know, you're trying to escape seeing the black dots, but you can't. It's like the black dots is it. It's really no black dots there, you know? It's crazy. If, if there's like, you know, nobody to really talk to on the gate, speak it out loud. Start talking to yourself. You know, speak it out loud, just start pacing back and forth, like, yo, yo, this is crazy. Yo, whoa, yo, when I was in the street, yo, it was real, yo, da 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 da. Yo, damn said, look at me, I'm in a box right now. It's crazy, yo. What the f yo, whoa. Yeah, but damn, yo, tomorrow though, yo, my visit. Yo, I can't wait till tomorrow, yo. That's what I'ma say. Like, yeah, what's going on? Uh, uh, yeah, and, you know, just you know, like that. This is this is crazy. You become loony. I'm loony. No doubt about that. The, I mean, you hear people screaming. Like, you hear people screaming, get me the f out of here! Get me out of here! Kicking, kicking they cell door. Get me out of here! I wanna f be in here! See yo, I'ma hang it up! Man, you become your own worst en enemy in a box. You know? My main concern is the use of solitary confinement. I want to see uh, those facilities and I want to be able to talk to people who are uh, in isolation. The number of people in solitary confinement in the United States is by far the largest in, in the world. In legal terms, the Convention on the Rights of the Child specifically says that uh, uh, solitary confinement for uh, young offenders uh, is, is prohibited. It's prohibited as a matter of international law. Uh, and it's not uh, capricious. It's because the medical and the psychiatric literature uh, demonstrates that um, young offenders suffer isolation in very different and much worse forms than adults. They don't want certain things exposed. They don't want people to see how, you know, these folks are actually living inside. So that's why they don't want, probably more than likely, they don't want anybody coming in because they don't want to see, you know, especially they don't want anybody to see the damage it's doing to the people as well. Until you've walked in the shoes of a correction officer uh, inside the city's jail system, uh, please don't pass judgment on us because you know what? It's, it's a tough job. Every day that you cross that bridge to come to work, you take your life in your hands. There is no second chance when you're a New York City correction officer. You go in to the belly of the beast and you handle whatever comes your way. Some people would say punitive se segregation is barbaric. It's not barbaric when the inmate that is uh, in punitive segregation took a cup of 190 degree water that he was supposed to be using to make his coffee with and doused another inmate to where the inmate's skin is peeling off of his face. It's not barbaric on our part to put him in punitive segregation. We're putting him there to protect himself and others from the harm that he brings. They have so much testosterone that they are just, it's flying off the walls. And these guys are going at it. And they're going and going and going and going. Like the Energizer Rabbit, they just don't stop. And sometimes you have to use force. And when you use force, I instruct my officers, use whatever force is necessary to terminate that threat. Punitive segregation, that is our only way to ensure that you follow rules and regulations in the jail. Because if we allow you to commit whatever fractions that you want, then it's okay for me just to assault you every single day and nothing happens to you. 
we fought vigorously to ensure that those that commit infractions in the city's jail system are sentenced to punitive segregation time. Those are the rules. You broke the rules, you can be placed in a solitary confinement unit. So it's, it's not like an inmate was just put there without a reason. You know, people knew I was a photographer, so you would have officers that were tired, we have parties, I used to bring my camera. These are actual pictures that I gathered uh, while working on Rackers Island C-74 at the Adolescent Detention Center. These are pictures that I've taken over, over 12 years of my life. And each picture tells a story. And with this story, um, my mission is to, to try to deter youth from going to jail. Eight feet by six feet cell, I could stick both hands out and actually touch both sides of the wall. So it's a very, very small space, and it, it gets smaller if you're in solitary confinement, locked in for 23 hours a day. If you have that inmate that's abusive to staff, he must be separated from everybody else. What if he's abus abusive to other inmates? Um, what if he just can't survive in general population? There must be some areas like that, but to be locked in for 23 hours, that's, that's, when it, that's when it gets tricky. You know, what are you really trying to do to me? Are you rehabilitating me or are you trying to destroy me mentally? 23 hours of locked anywhere is, is you know, um, not right. My son violated probation, and he actually went to the same prison that I used to work at. I, don't, I forgot who the officer was, but it was like, yo, your son, your, your son is here. You know, how was he gonna handle solitary confinement? Adults may know how to handle certain situations mentally, but Imagine a young child that is locked in an area sometimes the size of a bathroom. How does he mentally cope with, with that, being in that cell sometimes for, for two months, three months, four months? You know, sometimes, you know, they don't, they don't lock dogs up for, for, that, for that period of time. So could you imagine somebody locking a dog up for 23 hours and you could imagine Peter and all those people protesting, and but you know we can't do that for a human being that's that's locked up for 23 hours. Something is wrong. I'm 17 years old, and we're in room 13 of B unit at Santa Cruz County Juvenile Hall. The first time I was here was for assault with a deadly weapon. The second time I was here was for a probation violation. And the last time that he was here, there was an incident where he was assaulted towards staff, and he had flooded his room, and so there was water on the floor, and he had thrown his tray. I was like, I was pissed off, so like I uh, pushed, pushed the staff and I kind of slipped, and then I got tackled and like landed and like and, like they had to hold me, and I was like in a face of it's like water, you know. Out of that, he was placed in room confinement, and he was placed in isolation, and he was in the isolation room. He could have been in there for in and out of there for 30 days. We were struggling with him. The goal is always to get the youth back into full program. And so how can we do that? And how can we do it safely? The ability to treat somebody like a human and to really work with them on a personal level, of course you're gonna get better 
you're going to build a better relationship and you're going to avoid more incidents than if you treat somebody like an anonymous face. And that's kind of a whole part of the facility. We don't treat people just like their inmates. We treat them how we'd want to be treated. You know, respect goes a very long way. I mean, I was concerned. You're, you're, you're also taking a kid who has a history of violence. He's strong. We've had issues. And basically, you're handing him a weapon. You're handing him a big tool. Um, but staff gave me feedback in terms of, no, it's, this is his passion, and he's not going to harm a musical instrument. And so I had to trust staff that what they were saying to me and that they knew this person. They've gotten to know this individual, and that was true. <laughs> I am getting his compliance. I mean, he's got something to work towards. I have that little bit of trust, and out of that, I'm, you know, my staff aren't being injured. We're not having to restrain him. It's an easy, it's a win-win for me as a superintendent. The staff are really supportive of it, actually. It's, they're always saying, oh, you should play, whenever I'm like, watching TV, they say, oh, you should play the acoustic guitar back here and keep practicing. I'm like, all right, it's, mm -hmm. it's nice because they support me in music. Yeah. You have to be able to give a little bit and trust a little bit and give um, the youth some space and see if they're going to you know, step up. The idea that isolation is a time to think or a time out, um, I, I think it's, it's, it's a myth. I think it's only in the most extreme cases that you use that. And again, that has to have checks and balances. And that would be when someone's, you know, really violent or going re hurt themselves to the point of possible, you know, serious injury or serious injury in others. But but, you know, that's, that would be the exception. Anything else would be just a, the wrong thing to do. You gotta work your way to get to where they at, all right? This is your first time ever being in this group. Yeah, so you gotta work your way up there, all right? Being in the box as a teenager and you know, going through all of this, it, it, it took a toll on me mentally. And only because it's like, damn, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a teenager. I shouldn't have to be dealing with all of this. I'm a kid. Like, I'm, I'm a kid. Like, yeah, I don't care how grown I may think I am, but I'm still a kid. You know, like, why, why would you want to put a kid through this? I'll explain my experience with my daughter, especially my experiences of being incarcerated, being in a box, you know, what it, what it did, how it looked. Also to put them in the mindset of, you know, this is where I don't need to land yourself. You know, daddy already did that. I, I was there, you know, I saw it firsthand. I witnessed it, I've been through it. You know, go this way. That way is better. That way, no good. <laughs> 